10th of June at 12 o'clock. If you'd like any more information, um, you can see Sue Bolton about it, who's coordinating it in Melbourne. Sue, can you put your hand up, please? That's Sue over there. Um, and Rag will be taking over a carriage on the train and putting up banners and everything. If anyone wants to join us in going down to Melbourne on the train, um, you can see me or anyone else from the group. Um, now, I'd just like to introduce Pamela Kerr. Pamela Kerr is the um, campaign coordinator at the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre. And she's just going to say a few words about mandatory detention. Here she is. Hello everybody. What a beautiful day. What a beautiful place. Aren't we lucky? And it's a good thing to remember, isn't it, that the first boat people, and my forebears were not quite the first, but soon after, we took this land and we didn't ask permission. So let us remember the Indigenous people who are the real holders of the land. And let us also remember that subsequent waves of boat people have built this country into the beautiful, strong, safe place it is for most of us. But there is a dark side. As we stand here this morning in the sun on a late summer's day, we know that we will go home safe. We know that our family members will gather at dinner and we don't have to worry that they've been taken they've, by militia, that they've been bombed, that they've been shot. We don't have to worry. We know that we are safe in this country. And we also know that for most of us, we have rights. But there is a dark side, and that's why we're here today, because you are very special people. You're going against the tide. You're actually questioning. You've opened your eyes. You know what a wonderful place this country is, but you also know that it's got a dark side. And that dark side is seeing 5,000 people locked up in detention centres in the most isolated parts of Australia. In Sherga, I went to Sherga. Hundreds of men locked up there in a place 40 minutes from Weeper, a tiny little town which depends on mining and crocodiles. Uh, I mean, just a godforsaken place. Darwin, Curtin, Christmas Island, all the, the, the faraway places, and they put these people as far as possible from your eyes, your hearts, the media's eyes, the legal, the legal rights that they're entitled to. But let's not talk about generalities. Let's remember we're here thinking about people. Yesterday I went to the MITRE, the Melbourne Immigration Transit Accommodation, down the road in Broadmeadows. I know some of you used to be there. used to be teenagers there, and then they uh, removed all the kids. Um, the uh, Melbourne people and the Melbourne lawyers were a little bit too activist for their liking. And now there are single men in this camp, and they're coming and going and toing and froing. But I want to tell you what happened yesterday. I went to visit some friends who I know um, need uh, lawyers because they, their cases have reached that stage. And I was drawn to a Sri Lankan man who's been there for three years, nearly three years. He's been in Christmas Island in Darwin and he's in Melbourne. And this man is very, very ill. Three days ago, he begged a senior officer to kill him. He said, I have nothing to live for. Two days ago, he was visited by the Human Rights Commission. After that meeting, he went back to his room and took an overdose. And yesterday, when I saw him, he's so unstable on his feet, the guards were walking him around. Now, you know, we know that Serco guards and DIAC people are in a very punitive, uh, corrupt system. But we have to remember, too, they're not all evil. And clearly, there was a great deal of concern for this man. But they can't do anything, so they don't. Now, the man came and sat down next to me, and he sobbed silently, shaking. And then he said to me, come to my house, I will show you my daughter. So he led me across the compound to his dormer door. And the guard stepped forward and said, you can't go in. I said, don't worry, I'm not going in. And he pointed to a little red balloon on the bed, and he said, 
look, my daughter, she's sleeping. And then he said, it was a green balloon. He said, look, my mother, she's crying. My brother who was killed, he's gone to Jesus. I want to go to Jesus too. This man is hallucinating. He's psychotic. We have a broken spirit in his mind. baby daughter and his mother in his daughter room. He wrote a letter a couple of days ago to his lawyer. I spoke to the lawyer this morning I'm not talking to him and anybody will listen really. The lawyer said to me this letter must be public. I just want to read you a little bit because the government and the immigration department and all the, the gravy train that is sucking on the detention teeth forget that these are real human beings. They're not just asylum seekers. They're not just refugees. They're people like us, born in countries where they don't have our advantage, where they don't have our safety, where they don't have our rights. And they're knocking on our door, which is their right, and asking for our help. I just want to read this for you. He's addressed it to the head of the immigration department. Respected sir, and he's given his name, which I won't give for his own. I have been kept under detention by the Australian Immigration for the past 30 months. Till now there's been no resolution regarding my case. At this instance, I would like to express my mental and emotional state, which has been deteriorating. I am a family man with a wife and a young daughter who expect my support for their day-to-day -day survival. My future at this point is a question mark where I'm unable to do, pursue further education or livelihood, to be a good father, to provide for my family or myself. He said, I'm also faced with the responsibility of taking care of my elderly sick parents and my elder brother's family. My brother died on the 30th of February, 2010. And then he goes on and he says, I have coped and coped and I am forced to write this as I am unable to go through this situation and handle this anymore, which is torturing and killing me. I request you and beg you to give me an opportunity to restart my life in Australia. And he goes on, if you are unable to grant me the token to live a decent life in Australia like any other human beings, I beg you to kill me on a mercy basis now as I am unable to handle this anymore, I've lost the ability to revive my strength in coping with the situation. Now, he is just one of many. There are the people who have got an adverse ASIO security mark. No one will tell us why or how, but there is a leaker in ASIO who has said that this man was chosen because he spoke English and he was on the Oceanic flight, this is payback. They saw him as a leader. He was not a leader of that movement. What he did was he used his English skills to interpret to the people and to the officers when they were negotiating. He is getting payback. Now, ASIO will not release the reasons why they give these adverse security assessments. Can you believe it? Can you believe that you could be charged by the police and not told why? That's the situation that these people are in. There are other people in our detention centres now called POI. This is a new one in the last week. Persons of interest. What does this mean? This means people who may have been charged with a crime whilst they're in detention. There's a man currently locked up, although he's been found to be a refugee, has no adverse ACO security. He stole a packet of turmeric, a packet of turmeric from the kitchen during the Christmas Island riots, and for that he remains in detention for 11 months, waiting for a court case. This is the bizarre and ridiculous situation that you're not reading in the media, but this is the fact. He gave a packet of turmeric back for God's sake, and still they persist in this craziness. There are people who were charged with crimes. There was a young bloke charged with a crime, found to be a refugee, positive security. He 
sat and waited in detention for 11 months to face a trial on his crime of breaking a television set. They flew